people who, just by lowering the carb content of the diet, can lose weight, but they don't have to get to the point that they're ketotic. I find it hard to believe that people who try these diets, actually a significant amount of them, make the kind of effort necessary. One thing I didn't mention is I, I recently co-founded a not-for-profit. So I have a colleague in San Diego, a doctor named Peter Atia. He's got a blog you guys should all read called The Eating Academy. He's a kind of an amazing guy. And we joined up two years ago, and we were talking about a lot of things we could do to try and solve this problem of these food controversies. And we decided one thing we could do fairly easily was a not-for-profit, and it was going to be a nights and weekends type thing. And we would fund some specific experiments that should settle these issues. Incredibly naive at the time. But <laughs> one of the things I did is I did an economics podcast with a guy named Russ Roberts called Econ Talk. And it turns out economists like me because they like to think there's a science in the world worse than macroeconomics. <laughs> and a couple of days after doing this podcast, I got an email from a guy who said he runs a foundation in Houston and they've been thinking about funding obesity research. And I mentioned a couple of experiments I'd like to see done. And I Googled this guy and he turned out to be. 38 years old and worth $3.5 billion. John Arnold, legendary hedge fund trader. He and his wife have committed 90% of their fortune to their foundation. They are dedicated to changing the world in a variety of areas. And so we had a lot of conversations with the Arnolds and the Arnold Foundation, and they eventually got behind us, and they gave us money to open offices in San Diego on the condition that my colleague Peter Atia quit his job and run it. Uh, Peter gets a lot of credit because he's such an impressive guy. I don't think they would have done that for anyone else. And we've now, they've now given us $40 million to fund research, and which is a lot of money. And the joke is we've got it committed to three experiments, and it's not even enough. So we still have to raise $15 million. But one of the experiments, the main experiment, will just take this idea The question is, if you change energy stores, do you have to do it by increasing intake or lowering expenditure? Okay, so what we're going to do is an experiment where we basically are going to take overweight obese subjects. And not by we, I mean we've recruited a consortium of some of the leading obesity researchers. These are people I interviewed in the course of my book who I thought were thoughtful men, potentially good scientists with the caveat that they believed something I thought was nonsense, and I believed something they thought was quackery. But I thought that they would be, if they did the experiment, they would do a good job, they'd be skeptical. So they designed an experiment where the idea is you take overweight obese men, you bring them into a metabolic ward where you can completely monitor everything they eat and feed them everything they eat. And every two days, every week, we're going to measure, they're going to live in a metabolic chamber where they have the energy expenditure very accurately. And by three weeks, three to four weeks, we'll have them what's called weight stable, and we'll know that they exactly how much energy they expend when they're weight stable. So what we'll now do is we'll feed them a diet of exactly what they expend. So E in will be equal to E out. But now you change the macronutrient content of the diet, and it starts with the pilot study for long reasons, in which the Macronutrient composition is a ketogenic diet. So basically, you pick a diet that will maximally lower insulin levels. So the idea is you change the regulation of the fat tissue so that it should mobilize fat and oxidize it by lowering insulin levels as low as possible. And then you fix the energy in to equal energy out at the beginning of the experiment. And then you measure energy out because if delta E goes down, because you've changed the regulation of the fat tissue, then E out has to go up, because the laws of thermodynamics have to be true. So it's called the primary endpoint is energy expenditure. Secondary endpoint is you measure fat mass and body composition. So the idea is just by changing the macronutrient composition of the diet, but keeping the intake constant, we can change someone's weight. Mm -hmm. And if we do, if we make them lose weight, then they're under eating right, because E in is less than E out. So we've actually changed energy balance just by changing the regulation of 
Um, so it starts with the ketogenic diet because that's the easiest to do and that's the one where we know we've lowered insulin. But then the question is, is that necessary? So after we did this pilot study, we then moved to a randomized controlled trial where one of the diets will be a ketogenic diet, one of the diets will be a low-carb diet of about 15% carbs, so it will not be ketogenic. And then the third diet will be a controlled diet, and what we'll find out is whether or not, among other things, if we see an effect, whether it's a threshold effect that requires ketosis, or whether you can also get it. And I bet you could, that it's pretty much a, um, you know, a, a, a You know, and then it's not a threshold effect, but we'll find out. We only have to raise another $12 million, which is why I'm asking if there's any billionaires in the audience, we could use a couple more. <laughs> Personally. Um, we got time for about one more question, guys. And then Carrie's got to get on a plane. Weston Price was a Cleveland dentist and a very well-respected dental researcher who, in the beginning of the late 1920s, traveled around the world with his wife and Mrs. Price, as he refers to her in the book, and visited, basically did a series of sort of quasi-controlled observations where he would look at, for instance, he starts in Switzerland, right? And so he goes up... Uh, into the Alps to a village that's like 4,000 feet higher than any road and he studies what they're eating and takes pictures of their teeth and shows that they have perfect teeth and gums and then he goes down to Zurich and does the same thing figuring they're the same genetic stock and then he travels around the world to Africa and does it with like pygmies and um, Australia with Aborigines and New Zealand with Maoris and the US with Native Americans and it's funny, so the book is called Nutrition, Physical Degeneration. You guys should all read it. It's unbelievable. Um, when I try to keep my kids off sugar, it's because I'm trying to save money on braces as much as anything else. So it's page after page after page of, like, you know, population going like this, and pictures of their teeth and their gums. But it's also an amazing travel guide, circa 1930. So he tells these crazy stories, like how pygmies kill elephants by coming up behind them and slowly sawing through their hamstrings. Apparently the elephants don't feel this. And then when they hamstring the elephant, they can go around and kill it. You think this is just the craziest nonsense you've ever read. And then you turn the page, and there's Mrs. Price in a khaki skirt and a pith helmet standing next to two pygmies with elephant tusks. You know, um, but the, the general idea is populations that are exposed to Western foods, and this is a common theme that's all over both my books, have bad dentition, cavities. Peter Cleave, who I mentioned, considered dental caries the sort of comb, the, the canary in the coal mine. It's the first thing you see when you add sugar and white flour to a diet. And then all these other diseases follow. Um, Price, because of the sort of school of dentistry came out, it was also obsessed with the dietary fat that they weren't eating and the vitamins and minerals that they might not have been getting in the soil from the plants that they weren't eating or the plants that their animals weren't eating because they had replaced it with um, <coughs> flour and sugar. I kind of took the simplest possible version of that argument, which is it's the presence of the sugar and flour that's the problem. Um, and I think, again, there's a lot to be said for the quality of the dietary fats, but um, the, the, the presence of the sugar in the flour is the sort of simplest possible explanation. Anyway, this book, Nutrition, Physical Degeneration, has been constantly in print since Price wrote it. Like I said, you can skim over large portions of it, um, but it's a fascinating read, if nothing else, because of the travel guide from the 1920s, 1920s and what this guy saw in his population.
All right, well, I won't make it awkward for him, so thank you.